Just to be clear, I have way more than 99 problems. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'll give you, he sort of stole my thunder, but we'll, I'll tell you how this thing happened. But um, what it is, is like, I'm not here to like tell you how to put like certain colons and commas in Helm charts. And like, that's not what I'm going to do. If I'm successful, I make you all laugh. You get a little bit of a, my 30 year history of configuration management and um, make fun of some interesting people that I actually really love, but I am going to make fun of them. Uh, who I am, um, 40 years of doing this crazy stuff we did. I started actually as operator on mainframes writing assembler code. Um, I actually was Exxon. I, I, I worked um, for Canonical on the first, this is pre OpenStack. Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud. I'm mean, a terrible, terrible, terrible piece of software. But um, and then went over to Chef. I was the ninth person in Chef. But long story. Um, I sold the company to Dell, which was very interesting. Sold the company to Docker. Spent a couple of days here. Long history. Not going to bore you. Look me up. Um, but now um, Andrew Schaefer, some of you might know, called me in September and said, "Hey John, how would you like to come work with me at Red Hat?" And I was like. Andrew, this is John. You called the wrong guy, right? Um, and he's like, no, no. Like, we could do something cool. And I'm there, and I think we're going to do something cool. We'll see. I don't know. So yes, this, uh, this tweet. So I'll tell you why I wrote this. Like, like we do. We make fun. We do silly things. We, in the middle of, like, to just clear our heads, we go out to Twitter and try to say something like that sounds clever, maybe funny, um, maybe it's terrible. Um, sometimes you get into like year wars where you want to quit the industry, but uh, another story. Uh, so I did this, and I'll tell you why. And then I got like an hour later, like your uh, CFP has been selected. I'm like, okay, well, I'll play along. I didn't know it was Chris. I should have known. And I'm like, okay, I'll play your silly game. Thanks. About three months ago, I get a call, and I'm like, hey, you know, you're speaking and get Gantt and Kvi. I'm like, I thought that was a joke. But hey, <laughs> all right. So, I, I, you know. In all like things of like hi history that doesn't matter, I think I'm the first person who got a CFP selection via a tweet. So, uh, Mark Burton told me for you on a tweet. Yeah. Dang that guy! He's always beat me out. Um, I love Mark Burgess. Like, don't get me started. So I don't know if you guys remember last year, um, Rod Johnson, the guy, the person who wrote Spring, um, wrote this blog article in defense of YAML. And the truth was, he was really sort of ragging on YAML. But he was ragging on YAML in what, what I would say the right way. And, and I'll, I'll talk about what he, you know, like, you know, like, he's like, I'm doing this for all of you. Like, you know, you know, and again, like, again, I'm making fun of people that are far more successful than I'll ever be. But, but here's the thing, right? Like, he did, like, in the article, right? You know, this is GitLab's build uh, YAML. It was 1,100 lines of code. It basically had variables and inline scripts. Now, he shamed them because they've rewritten it. But, but like that was his point. Like, we've gone haywire here. Like, if we're writing 1,100 lines or 1,200 lines of YAML, and we're, you know, we're building inline scripts with variables, and like, this is not code, folks. Right? Um, and, and anyway, like, as things happen, of course, the Twitter stream went nuts. And everybody then was having these sort of Discussions and debates about DSLs and and as we do and you know and, and you know the hacker news like you know uh, you know like it's it's like it was back in day with XML and and YAML is you know defensible from a yeah you know, but not as a programming language and and that last one kind of stuck with me where for the history and I started thinking I've been doing this for 30 years uh, 40 years but 30 years sort of seriously involved in um in, in something we would call configuration management. And I thought about like how sort of ridiculous we all are as an industry, in that we're always fighting and debating and having these like circular discussions. And then furthermore, the reason I wrote that sort of tweet was, and I'll get back to this, which was, you know, back in the day, like if you walked into a sort of a configuration management camp or God forbid, a puppet conference or a chef conference and said, Look at my awesome set of bash scripts that do configuration management. You would be murdered. They'd be chasing you with pitchforks, right? And but now, like, it's kind of vogue again, right? Like, bash scripts actually 
kind of are not that of that away. So that's sort of the theme of like the craziness of what we do, right? Um, you know, we started off with shell screens. So I started, I actually started mainframe, but if you go back 30 years ago, you know, I was thrown into some accounts where I do nothing, and one of them was uh, an AX shop, you know, AX5, and there were no scripts because everything was run by this thing called Smitty, and it basically did everything you needed through a, a terrible GUI, but you didn't have to know anything really about sysadmin, although you could break some really bad things. Um, and then, like, my next gig is at a Solaris site, Solaris 5, and there's only scripts. And it's scripts to do everything, right? So early 90s, basically, it was, that was sort of my universe of large banks and insurance companies. And then comes this, what I call first generation, and that's where I sort of got serious, and this is a product that most of you young in this hood never heard of, it's a product called Tivoli. I built a consulting company with about 50 people. We were the best Tivoli consultants in the world. I have scars up and down my legs to prove it. Um, and, then, um, and then we ran into what I call second generation, which is going to, we'll see, like Chef, Puppet, CF Engine. And then I think, you know, Eric did a good job yesterday sort of describing what I'm going to call third generation. And, and like, you know, if you don't like this way I describe it, I'll use the uh, Winston Churchill quote of, history is kind to me because I'm writing it. Um, so, um, and then like we're sort of back to shell scripts, right? So I, I sort of thought about that, you know, Eric had used the um, Mike Hadlow uh, configuration complexity clock. So I sort of said, okay, here's the circle, right? Like, you know, like there were scripts somewhere, um, you know, 80s, 90s, you know, um, really configuration management sort of commoditized version actually started in the 2000s, right? Um, all through the 90s, you had um, so this sort of getting ready for year 2K. So again, you, you all might not remember this, but like there was a real panic in the enterprise about like those, that extra bite that wasn't there and how much like the world was going to end, which it didn't. But um, a couple of companies sold a ridiculous amount of software on that fear. Um, and I made a lot of money as a consultant during that fear. And then we get third generation. And so in other words, you could call this presentation the drunken history of configuration management. So, I, if I'm not funny, you don't have to laugh, but if you do think it's funny, you can laugh. So, just, just saying. So, like, so first sort of early days, right, everything was scripts and, and like, I don't know how many people actually got to experience a data center that looked like this, right, a couple people, right, like, it's that one right there. Get that one. If you just unplug that one, shh. You know, the whole executive suite goes down, right? So, um, you know, that, I mean, there are closet. That, that's not a closet that I looked at, worked on, but like I've had ones that look like that. And so, what did I do? What did people do with my time? We either did born shell or corn shell, and that was determined by whether you were AIX or Solaris. <laughs> it was that simple. There were these crazy people out there. Now, I'm going to make fun of everybody. So, like, if you're offended, like, every, these people that did the C shell, the CSH stuff, but they also did like e uh, Emacs and shit like that. So like I didn't understand those people. So <laughs> anyway, but um, so because I'm not a sysadmin, I play one on TV. Um, and then we had Larry Wall, right? Like so Larry Wall, right? Like the guy wrote Perl. If you were in the early '90s and you were doing any form of distributed systems programming, you were a Perl ninja. Worse than that, you were in this sort of Game of Thrones of who could write the smallest snippet of code to do the most complex thing that you could ever have happen, right? Like, like I can do that, like, change that, do this, do this in eight characters, right? Like, that was the game that you did, right? Like, so, and, you know, but his virtues were like, I mean, I think they were right, but for the wrong reasons, to be honest with you, you know, I, I, you know if I spend a waste of bunch of time on sort of what I think is great about DevOps is it's not laziness, like we do it for a reason. It's not sort of impatience, you know, like you don't tell somebody, get the F out of my office, go read the F manual. You do it because you want to teach people. To, anyway, I, I got a problem. But I, I, the point is, like these are the right virtues for the wrong reasons, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and just to sort of summarize this sort of prehistoric age, right? We had things were procedural, Mostly ad hoc. I mean, it was Bob's directory with Bob scripts, and if Bob died, basically the company was in big friggin' trouble, right? Um, 
you know, and, and it was very ad hoc. It was, it was, at the end of the day, it was completely divergent no matter how good of a person Bob was, right? Um, it was, you know, if you heard the pets cattle, it was definitely pets. Um, and, and it was, it was um, very, it was inconsistent and I would say, um, you know, like I'll, later I'll talk about a paper by Steve Turgot. I heard he, he spoke here like last year, but, but he would call this version divergent, right, of, a, of an infrastructure. And then we got first generation. Again, most of you are probably were not born yet when I was getting my scars in this thing, but um, it was like 1996. I'm doing consulting on AX for IBM. I don't work for IBM. I get called back to Raleigh to find out about this company out of Austin that's basically a bit of about 50 million in revenue, and IBM pays 743. Now, those are big numbers now. Imagine how big number that was in 1996. Um, just to give you perspective, a year later, they were doing a billion in revenue. So they took a $50 million product, in one year it's doing a billion. You gotta know what that means. The support of the software was terrible, right? Um, but, but what fleshed out is this, what I would call the first generation, which was, you had sort of IBM with this Tivoli, you had HP, um, who basically, um, had the, um, they acquired really two companies, and again, give you sort of drunken history here. One of them was called Opsware. Opsware, anybody know who Opsware was founded by? Andreessen Horowitz, uh, you know, Andreessen and Horowitz, the, you know, the, the famous VC, Andrew, Mark Andreessen, software was in the world. I mean, that was their first, well, he had Netscape, but this was his first real money maker. Um, and then there was another company called Novadime, and this is kind of interesting, Al Albie Fitzgerald, I knew him, um, he went and sold that, his company, and then he created another company called Manage IQ, who he sold the Red Hat, which actually was the starting point of OpenShift. So anyway, the, it's, a, it's a crazy history world. BMC, Blade Logic, might have heard of it. There was this young kid who just got a chemistry degree, and he was sort of couldn't find any work in ch chemical engineering, so he started doing Blade Logic consulting. Luke Kinnis becomes Puppet. Anyway. And then, you know, if you haven't heard the Jeffrey Snover story, like, just write this down. Google Jeffrey Snover taking Windows out of the Windows server. He's the guy who introduced shell scripts to Microsoft. There's a part of his story, you know, I'm going to have to go fast around it, he's got to tell the story, where every at Microsoft hates him. They can't understand why he's not doing things in Windows. And the story goes that Steve Ballmer walks into his office and says, what the fuck don't you understand about Windows? <laughs> like, like, I mean, he changed Microsoft. I mean, he, he wrote PowerShell, I mean, and, and like with a lot of people really hating him for doing it. Um, you know, so, all right, summarizing first generation, like, it's loosely declarative, it's mostly descriptive, it's sort of manual and ad hoc, it's better than Bob Scripps. Right, I mean, like it really is sort of at least you're putting some deterministic structures together, um, but there's no set, no, nothing of what we sort of, you know. And what I'm trying to say in these generations are these are the major changes that happen. So we still didn't have sort of desired state. We didn't have sort of the things we we learned from sort of what we call infrastructure as code. Um, it was sort of no pets, no cattle. Still divergent because even though the way you structured things, you still had this like. Saturday night, ro sat weekend rollout, right? And so it wasn't really sort of a consistent, so, and it wasn't disposable, right? Like, so, and, and just to give you, just for some fun, um, the way you had to do advanced things with these products, they had their, their it's called a software difference package, is you had to basically export what you think kind of worked, and then you sort of manipulated it. But here's the thing, you didn't dare put like spaces or tabs in this stuff because you were pretty certain the compiler would go places that no human should go. Um, and, and so you literally had this like, wrote like thousands of lines of just descriptives. And, and you can see there's some interesting stuff that like we go, oh, I, that's sort of in Puppet, that's in Jeff. Like, but, and then like, here's an example, like, for example, if you were doing, um, you would do it like, in the directory, you had to have sort of an add directory set of like an INI file, and then you had to make sure all your sort of add files were blocked in there. But again, no comma, no blank spaces, no tabs. I mean, it was just terrible stuff, right? And, uh, and then you, you could do executions, and the only way like you could get any sort of logic, right? Like most of the people, are, like we get a product and we 
since we're here, we're reasonably smart, so we're always having to do more advanced things than the product gives us. So this product gave us like some crazy way to do advanced things, like before, after scripts, remove scripts. So you could put a bunch of logic to sort of to get that thing that you wanted to get to in the real world scenario. But now you had this like new version of Bob Sprawl. Right? So it was, I mean it kind of worked, it was better, but it was terrible. So then we go to sort of second generation, and again, I'm just stealing that sort of clock. And, and so I wanted to show you this real quick. I can't give you the whole presentation because it would take too long, but about two years ago I did a history of DevOps and I had this artist sort of draw me the, um, sort of a, a timeline based on the sort of Grateful Dead, what a great strange trip it's been, uh, CF Engine in 1993, Puppet 2005, AWS 2006. Oh, so what do I, oh, I got to do this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I was like, typically people are not bored by this. Um, <laughs> now the question is, I got to scroll. All right, there we go. All right, so Grateful Dead, right? Timeline, it was like that two years ago. I wanted to go ahead. Right, you can get this PDF from me. Uh, CF Engine in 93, Puppet Labs. Um, you know, 2006. So I met Luke at OSCON in 2007. And so, um, you know, I see this pimply faced kid, you know, giving a presentation. I'm thinking, hey, what is he going to teach me? I've just done Tivoli. You know, five minutes in, I'm in the front row. I got my pad out, and he's literally changing my life. So for the next two years, I beg him for a job. Now, I got to tell you, I've been doing this 40 years. You know, I'm six years old. There's only two years of my life where I've ever had to beg for a job. And it was the two years begging Luke. Because I was like, dude, like, I can sell this in the enterprise. Ah, uh, John, I don't know, you know. And like, you know, like, Luke, I'm getting really pissed now. And then we have Velocity 2009. And I'm going to kind of stop there, right? But, but like John Ospar and Paul Hammond was, for anybody, for the person yesterday who didn't know who the second guy was. Um, the Andrew gave, unfortunately, Andrew's presentation was as brilliant as John's, but it wasn't videoed. And then, uh, you know. Adam, so let's just got to tell the story. So I run into Luke in the hallway, and I'm like, Luke, come on, man. You have to hire me. I really, and I'm like, can we figure something out? And he's, again, John, I just don't know. So he walks away. I'm like, you know, screw you. I'm tired of asking. I start walking down the hall, and there's Adam. And if those who don't know Adam Jacob, like, he's a sweetheart of a human, right? He's sitting at the table. He's like, John, why are you so sad? I'm like, you know what? And at this time I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'm too old. These young kids don't really want me to do this. Maybe, maybe I've just gone a step too far in this. And I said, well, and my ego shot, right? So I'm like, golly gee, heck, kind of. You think any kind of way that you would, like, reckon to hire me? And classic Adam puts his fist up and goes, fuck yeah. And I'm a chef, man. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, now I'm going to tease the shit out of you. I was at the first DevOps days with Chris and, and, um, and, and of course, Patrick, the godfather. I actually gave a chef presentation there. And, and then now this is where I'm going to be an asshole and just go through a whole bunch of stuff really fast. But um, there's that stupid whale over there. And, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that. But I wanted to point out, so I loved the keynotes yesterday. They were brilliant, right? And, and Rin's book, I mean, so I, I was, uh, me and Patrick and a couple of people, Pat, you know, Pat, uh, Gene Kim wrote this DevOps handbook, right? At the same time, they were coming out this book. And, the, you know, Gene's, you know, like, he's like, is, is it going to be, is it going to be, do we need to and all that? And I got an early copy and I'm like, no, this is, like, this is the version that four white guys didn't write, right? It was just a, a it was just, it had a whole, so, I mean, it was very technical, very, it's a great book. I mean, I honestly, like, I don't say the word great book uh, often. I mean, you should read it. And this is where I'll just tease the shit out of you for the rest of the stuff. But it's, but, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> the story ends well. The hero got the girl. You know, hey, no. Um, you know, so, um, Anyway, there, there is a presentation out there of that, so uh, anyway, um, but of course I don't have enough time and I'll probably go over and Baron's going to kill me, so. Um, so. So then, like, the second generation was sort of what I call the big four, right, which was the new four, right, which is CF Engine, you know, so if you don't know the story, Mark Burgess is a PhD uh, professor, he goes to sort of Oslo, becomes a computer science professor, looks at 
by default inherits managing the data center there, um, looks at the common you know, sort of generation stuff that's out there, says this is nonsense, as a scientist would do, studies the problem, writes a book, and basically defines what we all sort of enjoy as desired state, item potency, um, and you know, sort of convergence, all those things really came from Mark. And, um, and then um, Luke, Luke Canise, is a power user of CF Engine. Mark is a professor who's already moved on to something called promise theory. Luke is basically complaining that the user interface sucks and all this. At some point, Luke, brilliant man, gets frustrated, writes a Ruby version of CF Engine but he really models all the basically sort of architecture of it. Story goes on, Adam Jacob is sort of frustrated with, with Luke and some things. He gets frustrated and writes his own version, which becomes Chef. And then this is kind of a funny, somehow they made the mistake, the universe made the mistake of putting Michael DeHaan and Luke Kinnis in the same room when he worked together and the explosion became Ansible. So, um, <laughs> So therefore, and then my good dear friend. So I, I, I spent a lot of time like when I was at Chef, like, like turning puppet customers into Chef customers. And I think I won every battle except for this man here. He was my one person I couldn't convert and I love him dearly. But like, like so he wrote this article and what's interesting here is the comment section is like brilliant, right? Like Luke. Ezra, for the, the, the uh, founder of uh, Engine Yard, Adam, Tim Dysinger, just like, if you want to just read the history, read the comment section. But like, you know, like, I got Chris's point. There was, he made a really good point. But like, I had to laugh here. All right, let me just say, I love Luke. He's a beautiful person. But as he's Genghis Khan when it comes to sort of product and warrior. So when I see like Luke is confused to him yet, yes, he was. <laughs> He was confused about Chef. Um, anybody want to know why Chef exists? Just anybody? Yeah, what the heck, right? It's called Bug 1010. So Adam is in Seattle, and he's basically got about seven monster companies that he's built on the puppet infrastructure, making pretty good money. Luke goes up there and wants to do a business deal with him. Hopefully he wants him to start paying for puppet. Adam's like, dude, like I pay my consultants 75% of everything I make. I got 10% overhead. I got no margins to pay for, for Puppet. And by the way, we probably do Puppet pretty good and it's open source, isn't it? And Luke's like, Ugh. And so this is the reason Chef exists. If you read that sentence, in fact, it's the second one. Um, if, um, you know, if you, if you know, relationship, I clearly am, what I got is like, if you're not a customer, if you decide it, basically he told Adam that he's not an acceptable request. Adam had seven customers that was making big money for. And so Adam went to his consultants and said, give me two months, I'm going to rewrite this product. That's it. Luke accepts the pull request. There's no such thing as chef. So what is second generation configuration, right? Like it's, it's this sort of structure of I mean, it's language. I mean, Puppet had Puppet language. Chef had Ruby. Um, but it was the sort of the triumphant, the, you know, like you, you literally could look at any sort of cookbook and it had three things, right? It had sort of the um, package, it had the service, and it had the template, right? And then it was sort of item potency. There was, you know, there was convergence, desired state, like a lot of cool stuff. But to me, the thing that like was sort of the brilliance, honestly, out of all the things like, um, and by the way, it all came from Mark, right? But was that sort of last thing that I thought um, was just the sort of the thing that to me like put it all together, especially having spending like 10 years on sort of Tivoli stuff, which meant that first thought, everything was a first class primitive. So in, fir in first generation, things were just things. These were like object primitives. And they could be uncoupled in anywhere. I mean, you wanted to be nice from a readable standpoint and put them in the same place, but they didn't have to be. But the reason it didn't have to be is you had this asynchronous event model. So what happened here, if it's like, take the item potencies. So you come in, the package is already there, great. The uh, service is up, great. No up, no up. And nothing in the config after you run the template against it changes the whole recipe is a no op. Except if the package is already installed, the service is up, and when you run the template, 
the, the basically the checksum is different, you then can then dynamically notify the service to restart it. Right? Like, and that was sort of the brilliance in my mind of the like, second generation. And what's interesting for me is um, when I first, I learned, learned the products in reverse. I learned Chef first, Puppet second, and then, um, and then CF Engine last, right? And that's a whole other story. So I, I like, Adam's the most genius person in the world. How did he ever think of that genius way to create asynchronous sort of decoupled event notification? Like, and then I go and Puppet, I'm like, oh, it was Luke who was the genius. Then I learned CF Engine, I'm like, duh. It was Mark all along, right? Like so, it was. I mean, these were things that were just primitives in the original CF engine. Of course, the PhD, the you know, physics professor, would have this idea first. Um, Rin talked about like this, like great example with the chef, and I think it was the Apache servers, right? Like Jerome, you know, everybody should know who Jerome is, right? From Docker, he had a very similar, like I would go, like like you, you have ensure version over sells a list. It just goes out and does a bunch of stuff, and like, oh shit, we need 098. Like, well, tough, tough you asshole, you told me to go here, and like, now we can't find that package anywhere. Like, so, like, we got to, we, we over rotate on how smart these things are, right? The, the point being is, you know, CM tools are only as good as their sort of authors. Like, they'll do real stupid stuff if you tell it to, right? Um, you know, the pros, um, you know, uh, the, you know, like, so, so, like, second generation was awesome. I mean, I spent 10 years, like, being a prophet, a chef. I mean, people would, like, we were, if we were in a bar in an after party, like, okay, here comes Willis. So, God damn, he's going to open his laptop and give me a chef demo. Run for the hills, right? I mean, I couldn't resist it. Like, you got to see this. It's just crazy, right? And, uh, I mean, I was all in, right? I mean, um, now to think about how you had to do sort of variables and nodes, for, node variables and, and synchronization, it was terrible, but hey, back then I thought it was pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, self-documenting, um, you know, reusable, you know, and, you know, and like, so, you know, one of the things I loved about Chef was it was brilliant in parameterization, right? Like you could, again, now today both products are basically equal. Back when I was selling against Puppet, I walked into a client that had a thousand Apache manifests. And we converted them to three chef cookbooks. Parameterization, like, is really cool. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, they all, again, they're all equal now, but back then we had data bags. We could, we really could do database parameterization. Like, you really could, I mean, we were doing some real clever stuff. Um, it, it's consistent. Um, but here's the other thing about that clock. I don't care where you, and that clock will just keep running, right? Like, <laughs> Eric kind of gave us that clue yesterday. Like, once we get here, we're going to start all over again. You will always escape to bash scripts. They will never go away. There will always be a scenario. No matter how smart your product is, and how great it is, you're going to make a call to a bash script at some point. Trust me. I'll be long off this earth, and you'll go like, that idiot back in Ghent. I remember hearing he said that, right? Um, and, um, and, and so, and, and then we, it actually gave us the first opportunity to kind of create real testing harnesses, right? Uh, you couldn't do this in first generation, right? Um, you know, uh, the cons basically, there was learning curves, right? Um, you know, you sort of not only had to learn a language, it might not have been a language you liked, and then also it had its own idioms in that sort of language itself. And the truth was, like, even though Chef was Ruby, it really wasn't because it was a two-pass compiler. So it really sort of compiled into something other than Ruby. Um, you know, um, again, you always wind up, you know, shelling out, right? Like, in, in some of the worst sort of, exam you know, customer example, Cook Chef cookbooks were, like, just a bunch of scripts. <laughs> you know, the primitive is one recipe and then a script, right? Okay, yeah, I think you missed the point, bud. But, um, the, um, and, and the other thing here, there's a subtle thing, and, and when I get to third generation, I think it's important to recognize, and that is um, that they are sort of just in time. We say infrastructure is code, but that's really sort of a lie. Because when we think about code, most of the time, we think about it as being compiled and sort of uh, binary and immutable at that point. You know, a Java, a jar file, or something like that. When we say infrastructure is code, in, and when we're talking about CFN and Java, what we're really talking is really compilers code, right? Because every time we're running it, we are compiling it. So if we're running every 30 minutes, we're basically sort of going through a new mutation of what the output is. Now again, way better than Bob's scripts. Creates far more consistency than somebody's checklist. 
But you, you know, when you start getting to massive scale, the difference between sort of building a dev environment that is sort of built at this time and pulls certain packages and does certain scripts and then po possibly runs in QA three days later and then possibly runs a week later in prod, you do open up the possibility for variation. Talk more about that later. So the, so the point is, and, and we'll get to uh, uh, Steve Kerrgott's uh, paper in a little bit, but this would be a convergent, not congruent model. And we talked about convergence. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, finally, just summary, mostly declarative, fully automated, like centralized, right? First generation really didn't have a, you know, first generation was next weekend we're going to blow out 50,000 servers. And on Sunday you're at server 28,000 and it failed and like, okay, next weekend we're going to do 58,000 servers, right? Where, um, where most of the products had that sort of centrally, I will run every 30 minutes or every hour and I'll sort of converge, desired state. Um, I mean, everything you'd kind of want disposable. The, the early joke of sort of infrastructure code was, does it pass the throw it out the six floor windows server test, right? Like, yes, it can, um, but not immutable. And then, so I, I couldn't come up with a name here because like, I don't want to make fun of people that are here and like, there are some really good things on this, but there's certainly things I want to, so Michael Cote brilliantly gave me a great title for this slide, which is Citizens of the Plateau of Productivity. All right, so. Um, again, I'm an equal offender, but Juju, guys, <laughs> really? I mean, it's, I worked there. I mean, it's Simon, like, please don't do this. Please, either I want you to use Chef, but if you want to use Puppet, do not rewrite another configuration management solution. Um, Bosch, when a dear friend of mine who used to work at Chef and Puppet comes up to me after they went to Pivotal and say, well, John, you know, Bosch is actually, stop, stop. No, sorry, not have. And okay, pallet ops. I met these, these guys like uh, in Antwerp, like I don't know, five, six years ago. Right, they're telling me how like they've refigured it out. Really brilliant people, young, brilliant people. Their DSO was in closure. I'm like, yeah, like I like closure. But somebody who works at a bank for 25 years, not gonna wanna learn closure. And like you know a product is a failure when in order to, present a presentation for today, the find their logo, you have to use the Wayback Machine. So, um. <laughs> but on the flip side, Saul, Rada, awesome, love y'all. Uh, my, my dear friend, um, Damon and Control Tier, way before it's time. And then shout out to Ari Pinier, I think is just incredibly awesome for a gazillion reasons that would take too much time. But, but the, his influence of the you know, Marionette Collective you know, the M Collective product, it, 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 it changed. It has an interesting arc of history on its own. So, any, are you, I want to do my shout outs. Chris, love you, brother. Patrick, I don't know where you are. And Ari, like, again, these people, like, just incredibly helped me in my career. And then there's this kid. <laughs> I call him Kid Midas. So, the second DevOps day ever is in, um, is in uh, Hamburg. No, no, I'm sorry, the second Europe, second Europe one. Hamburg, and so this kid gets out there, and I think at this point he looks like he's 12. Actually, that was Gutenberg. <laughs> what? It was Gutenberg. Okay, well, let's let's stick with my narrative. I, I like mine better than you. This guy, you know. Um, so anyway, so I like this like 12 year old kid gets up there, and he's, and I'd heard about Vagrant, and then I got another side story about Vagrant, but, and like he's given a presentation, and Damon Edwards, who I've done these, a lot of work with over the years, and he says. He looks like he's a person who's been in an enterprise for 25 years. And like, yeah, you're right, you know? And then, like, I mean, ah, what? Like, incredible what this young man has done. I mean, he's not a young man anymore, but, but um, here's just another, again, drunk in history. Like, pull another drunken history card. So coming out of college, he wrote Vagrant. Vagrant was a chef-only implementation, great. Somebody tells me he should go talk to the chef folk about going to work there. Now again, I love you, Chris Brown, you're a genius. That development team was awesome. You know, Chris Brown wrote EC2 and then wrote Chef, right? You know, like, but they said Mitchell wasn't smart enough to work on their development team. <laughs> Huge mistake, gentlemen. But hey, I don't know, you know. I don't make the rules. And then we have the third generation. 
Now hold on everybody, because some of you are going to get mad right now. But we have what I call the criminals formerly known as Docker. <laughs> Thank you. Because I lost $2 million on this deal, so just to give you a heads up, all right? <laughs> so, uh, so, like, if you want to defend Docker, meet me at the bar, buddy, and we'll tell you, all right. But, all right, so in all fairness, Solomon made a sort of sea change in our industry, right? Like, there were containers, and, and you know, sort of Google had been doing it forever, and, and all the sort of passes. You know, in fact, the way I got involved in this, right, like, like there was Heroku and Engine Yard, and I didn't even have heard of Dot Cloud, right, which was the original company. They are, they've already burned seven million of a $10 million investment from Benchmark Capital, who was like Peter Fenton is the god of like investments. And, um, and they leave it for dead, and Solomon has this idea that all of the other passes are doing containers. Why don't I just commoditize this and like turn this over to everybody else? It's kind of a unicorn horse thing, right? Like, only the unicorns really understood how to really make in containers work really well. People like me who are horses were like, you know. In fact, I remember Stephen Nelson Smith, who uh, at one point worked at Chef, he wrote a book called Test Driven Development Chef. And in a late chapter, he talked about using LXC for massively scale testing with, um, with, in your CI CD chain. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a cool idea. I wasted three or four nights of my life trying to figure out how to do that, you know, like building an AMI with a kernel and like finding this blog that, you know, step three and four, you had to go to four of the blogs to find A, B, C, A. like I give, I, like it would have been fun. And then I, uh, I wind up meeting Solomon before they open up the repository. By the way, I was, I was offered a job to be the first person in, not that cloud, but the first person in a Docker. And I turned it down because I had a, another company we sold to Dell, different story. But but my experience was I had this terrible experience trying to get sort of containers to work, knowing it would be a brilliant idea if it was easy, and figure, you know what, it's not easy. And then um, I get early access to the Docker repo that was private, private at the time, and like I'm app get install Docker and AUFS and Docker run. And in fact, at that point, I didn't think it worked. I was like, oh shit, here we go again. And, you know, containers and me don't get along. And I was, it ran they didn't put any flags on it. So it just ran, right? And I was like, holy shit. Something that I spent three nights wasting my life on, I just ran in like six minutes. And I'm like, this is going to be big, right? And, and it was big, right? Like the, the way he, you know, I mean, like even in the early days talked about how they wanted to model Git. So like the push, the pull, like even the concept of like there was everybody sort of had their version of containers, but creating like a Docker hub. And, and giving the ability to have sort of commoditized shareable images, right? These were huge things that literally, well, you know, you saw what happened in 13, 14, 15, and 16. There was a point where in 16, like, Docker was like Coca-Cola. And then Solomon fucked everything up. But anyway, different story. Um, yeah, right, all right, so, you know, remember earlier I said if you showed up with a script, at like uh, um, you know infrastructure's code conference, you would just be flogged and like beaten and like how what a terrible human you are. In the five-year anniversary, don't correct me here. The five-year anniversary in Ghent, there was an open spaces on the topic of Docker files, and like I wish I had a recording because you would have thought that somebody had basically destroyed mankind. Like, the, like how could we go back in time? This. These Docker files, you know, it was like, like you had like the chef and the abstractions and like, what did we do? We went back to this, again, you get sort of my sort of theme of the silliness of, and today like Docker files, like you, there's no Git repo out there that doesn't have a Docker file in it, right? Um, you know, so, and then the other thing that was sort of, sort of jenning, sort of, it happened a little before, but you had this whole notion of immutable infrastructure, right? So I don't know, you know, back, Netflix wrote this article about, you know, building with Legos, right, which was the way they drove infrastructure was, and they're the ones that actually started the whole no ops nonsense, but, but they're, um, they would basically say that, you know, whenever you're about to deploy to production, you just pull an artifact, which was an AMI that was pre-baked, and it was, that was the thing, right, so, so it was sort of immutable to 
basically the operating system. But it wasn't full stack. And then Martin Fowler wrote a very similar sort of um, Phoenix from the Ashes, right? So there was this sort of themed immutable infrastructure. But when I got to Docker, I started thinking about, well, it's really now immutable delivery, right? Because if you think about immutability in the infrastructure, and it started at sort of, sort of an artifact repo, and then it was immutable. And that's great, except what the world, world, world really wanted was a developer could create some infrastructure on a desktop and have it binary immutable all the way to production. You know, to a percentage, right? Like we know there's still sort of difference. But in general, if I was running something on my sort of development environment with like six containers that all sort of work together and they were all pinned all the way through the pipeline and I got to production, I was pretty sure that if there was a problem, it was a 99% problem, it wasn't mine. Right, because I actually did the testing that I did, you know, like minus sort of, sort of the host and the node and the, you know, those things. But it just really gave developers first time this ability to have control all the way through the line. And in general, that's why Docker just blew up. Developers like, I like this. And, um, you know, and so I started talking about immutable delivery. I wrote a blog article. You know, I had written the, 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 um, the DevOps handbook in the three ways. And, but my real thing was, I spent a lot of time studying lean, right? Like I'm a Deming freak. I, I like really, I've done some work around the whole lean thing. I've really deep dived into it. And one of the things that in lean, uh, this is the question of four VL, right? These Vs. And one of the Vs is variation. And one of the things that like anybody in sort of manufacturing, variation is the root of all evil. Right, and, and so, um, so I found this old paper and I started using it as I do, as a weapon against Chef Puppet and all of the ones is that order, ironically, we use this paper against Puppet back in the day <laughs> to say that, you know, uh, you know, Chef was ordered and, you know, in the early days you had the DAG, right, and at scale, hey, another conversation, but, but, um, you know, the, the, but then I realized, like, this is a way better argument for immutable delivery um, or sort of immutable artifacts, which are containers. Is anybody completely lost at this point? Oh, that guy up there. Okay, we'll talk later. No. <laughs> All right. So, but, so I, I, th there's this thing that he did in the paper, which he talked about sort of divergence. I mean, he didn't talk about generation. I added that. Convergence and, and congruence, right? So, so divergence, what I talked about earlier, it's Bob. It's like chaos and even Tivoli sort of diverging because Maybe this Sunday, two Sundays from now, we'll do it. We get to converge it, right? This was a beautiful thing, right? Where we literally were sort of, everything should look like this. So every 30 minutes, we'll sort of force it to look like this. But you really was sort of a yo-yo of drift, convergence, drift, convergence. And then again, depending on how you ran, what you build, there were like, there were a lot of pockets for variation. And again, variation is the root of all evil. Um, and, and so, at the time, really, and I've talked to Mark Burgess, he's a good friend of Super, there really was not a product on the market that truly was congruent from configuration management, a la Docker or any implementation of a container structure is your perfect sort of congruent model, right? To the extent that what you built is, you know, binary immutable, again, some caveat. So I started thinking about this more, again, like, um, for those who know me, I usually, boy, you're way worse with Deming stuff, but, but um, statistical process control is a thing, like it's how they run nuclear plants. I mean, it's a thing, right? Um, and, and, and they have this idea of um, a, a statistical process control, and I won't, it, like, limits, and they think of things in, like, three sigma, and, and how things work. And so I was thinking about this sort of, the Deming rule of 68, 95, 99, 7, right? And that means that, like, the 68 is a one sigma, off the mean and um, the, uh, no, half the moon just fell asleep, but hey, um, the, um, and then there's sort of two sigma is the 95, and then three sigma is like where you want it, like that's the sort of sweet spot, right? Um, and, and so I thought about like, in a sense, convergent infrastructure is um, really sort of a one sigma, you know, maybe I'm being a little nasty and could have given it harder, um, you know, this sort of Netflix immutable infrastructure could be a two sigma, but the truth was when we got into things like binary immutable where developers create these things and they're pretty much binary immutable if we don't touch them, if we don't mutate them, which is the proper way 
um, to run, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, running system D in a container was sort of a stupid idea in my opinion, but hey, you know, we'll, we'll um, you know, that can be debatable, right? Like you know, atomic containers where PID1 is the application, right? Like that was sort of the right way to do it. In that model, you, you got really close to sort of a three sigma, right? And again, um, and you know, like there's like these great stories of, um, you know, Jez Humble and Lean Enterprise has that sort of one byte different story, if you haven't read it, where it took them weeks to figure out like there was just one byte different between the dev and the production environment. There was, um, this was never published, and I think it's, uh, uh, the statute of limitations are okay, but early days of CF Engine, they actually, um, at a large bank, turned on a CF Engine, so CF Engine C, very lightweight, they actually turned it into like less than a minute cycle. Like this is something that you, you never could do with Chef or Puppet, right? And what was interesting, they did this for like a day or two, where they literally ran the convergence like 40 seconds, 30, I don't know, it might have been a minute. Here's the thing, right? When they sort of mapped it all out, you know, so they had thought they had deterministically modeled everything that ran, right? When you turn down the cycle time of sort of a convergent model, they found that there was actually an unknown billion unplanned changes happening a day. Right? And then so if you've ever thought anything about or heard about systems thinking and butterfly effect, like imagine all the inertia that creates. Imagine all the Heisen bugs that creates if, there, if your infrastructure is actually having a billion unknowns. So variation, like we might not even see, like start following John Ospar's stuff, right? And start thinking about like sort of the, the world of complexity and complex systems and how thinking you know how it works is the wrong way to think about it, right? Give that you do not understand how it works and start from that perspective. So the pros are that, um, you know, less variation. Again, to me, I think that's the, you know, it's a big deal. When you start running a million containers or 10 million containers, right, um, that, that's going to make a difference in the things like the sort of Heisenberg and the, the sort of weird variation patterns that could happen otherwise. Um, totally faster provision. I mean, it just sort of like met at a perfect time with, uh, with microservices, um, cloud native, like, like it's just they all fit together perfectly. Um, you know, um, you know, like it, it sort of eradicated the use cases for a lot of infrastructure code. Although there still are even today um, a lot of good arguments for infrastructure as code for certain things that it really doesn't make sense to. Um, like I think I see companies trying to run batch jobs for mediation in banks, and they they fire up like you know a thousand Kubernetes clusters to run eight-hour batch jobs. Like yeah. I don't think that's where we should have went, right? Like, anyway, that's just one of many examples. The cons are, um, you know, um, the sort of DSLs took that downgrade. Like, and you can, you can argue, you know, back to maybe like YAML is the greatest thing that ever happened, and that sort of may be true. But if you look at the arc from scripts to sort of, you know, things like Tivoli descriptives, which got better, to sort of language primitives that have sort of this nice, you know, chef and puppet event notification I talked about. And now you're sort of arcing down to like Docker files, which is sort of less mature from that perspective, but have this sort of beautiful simplicity, you know, and you know, so again, you know, so there's this sort of arc that I think we, we just will always continually go through, you know, but in, in the end, um, you know, these models were partially declarative, um, you know, partially descriptive, fully automated, right? Like in other words, um, you know, like again, all the sort of benefits that you would get from a second generation that you could sort of, you know, and, and, and I think the other thing too is you sort of move to a mindset of just, um, you know, just throw it away re and repopulate it, right? Like so, again, immutability, if you have a change, just push the new sort of image, right? Um, certainly, we got cattle, not pets. Um, and it is, in this case, congruent, not convergent. Again, I think I made the point that there is a, a difference there. Um, repeatable, disposable, immutable. All right. And uh, wow, I mean, I didn't like, I thought this was going to take way longer than I thought it was. But anyway, um, so the new one normal. So now we go full circle. And uh, we are sort of back to sort of script sign, kind of like. People, like, I got 99 problems and a batch DSL ain't one of them. I'm seeing people thinking, yeah, you know, this batch script stuff wasn't that bad after all. If I format it right, if I put it in a directory structure, 
Like, you know, screw those people that made fun of me 10 years ago. So, 30 years. AIX Smitty, Sun scripts that did everything you could imagine that could ever be done. Going ahead and learning this terrible Tivoli product that had, you know, it didn't just do configuration, it did monitoring, it did security, it did, uh, you know, just like, you know, going into customers and feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to have to do this, but I am not going to be able to help them. Um, terrible feeling as a consultant, but you still cash the check. Um, I meet Luke Canis, I think, wow, I've been doing this wrong. This is the way we need to do this. Like this is, like, this is magic. Puppet was magical to me when I first saw it. I gotta say, Pulumi looked pretty magical tomorrow, but I haven't tried it yet. So anyway, I'll just table that one. But like, I, um, I, I hope I won't have to say Pulumi changed my life like Luke did, but hey. Um, but anyway, the, um, you know, again, Adam working at Chef and then sort of following this movement of that was just, I mean, you had sort of, I mean, just to get a little meta here for a minute, if you think about the last, like, I could make fun of infrastructure code all day long, say the world has to be immutable. The gentleman up there who gave the presentation, you know, about sort of this new world in atomic, Eric talked about if you have to put agents on systems, you're probably doing it wrong, right? Like, that window's done. There was sort of a 10 year window of, this puppet chef stuff. And, but here's the thing, right? The general commerce that we have today over the, is a sort of a Cambrian explosion. Cloud, oops. You have cloud, you have, um, you know, like, I mean, I don't know that you, if you didn't have those products, we couldn't have, like, Uber. Or, like, I mean, the things that, like, sort of, and again, we could argue whether that's a good thing or not. But, but the point is, I mean, but the, you know, like, so that we have to give that sort of generation its due because you combine it with cloud and like you, I mean, like I've done 11 startups, right? I mean, do a startup like is really hard to get successful, but really easy to get started. You go Google app, you don't need any office. You can get something on Amazon built really quick. I mean, like 25 years ago when I was doing my first, you know, 30, 30 years, actually, uh, yeah, 30 years ago doing my first startup, thanks. Um, it was hard. You had to, my first startup was a mainframe product where I had to convince a bank to let me use a mainframe from 11 p.m. to 4 in the morning. So for two years, that was my life. I literally would go to work at 11 p.m. I'd work the 4 in the morning. I'd have breakfast. Actually, back then, I did work out. I'd go to sleep. I'd wake up at about 9, and, and, I, and I, that was my life for two years, right? And because one bank was nice enough to let us use their sort of batch processing mainframe, right? Like, it was hard to write a product. All right, so, again, that's better. Like, that, like you have to give our due to sort of Luke, Adam, and, um, you know, and, and, and certainly Mark Burgess, right? And, and, and especially Mark Burgess. Um, so, but anyway, let's come through this arc. And uh, to my, you know, here, like, so I'm sitting here, right, I'm remembering how we mercifully made fun of people at Chef who brought scripts to the party. And then I see this product announced called Habitat. And I look into it a little bit, and I notice the DSL is bash. Now, I don't have my phone, but, hey, Adam, how's Elizabeth, how's the baby? Um, you know, was the weather okay? How's, what's the difference between, Adam Jago, between, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Hey, this Bash DSL thing, it's, it's an April Fool's joke, right? No, no, John. I'm like, no, you can't, after all. I mean, I'm, nobody's laughing, but like, like, you just can't imagine that a company that, like, and, and sort of a, a generation people that really would like tar and feather you if you tried to make an argument that you should do configuration with scripts, with shell scripts, that have just realized full circle, well, you know, John, actually sort of bash is the right sort of model to do a DSL. Like, I, I quit, game over. Like, 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 we're all idiots. Stop arguing about DSLs. Like, just use whatever works. YAML, if you actually want to write 1200 line YAMLs, God bless you, you know, so, um, Everything that's old is new again. Thank you very much.